Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is The Deep Corner, a new show on the VLA YouTube channel where I'm Rob Sinclair. I'm your host. I'll have VLA personalities on leading up to the season, throughout the season this summer to talk some volley. And my first guest is a man that needs pretty much no introduction, a four-time U.S. Olympian, an Olympic gold medalist, and a 2015 inductee in the World Volleyball Hall of Fame. Mr. Loy Ball, welcome to the show. Hey, Rob. Good to be here on the inaugural uh, cast of this program. Appreciate you doing it and uh, looking forward to a great inaugural season here for the VLA. Aren't we all? So I want to start off with asking, how are you these days? What's a typical day in the life of Lloyd Ball on, a, I don't know, a Tuesday in February? Exhausted. How about that? <laughs> yeah. So club season, of course, is the grind. And uh as we're getting here to the middle of it, uh, you know, the anticipation every year of club season, the 300 kids who come and try out, the 24 teams we have here at Team Pineapple, getting all the coaches lined up with the right kind of information on how we want to do things here. And then MLK hits and everybody's excited, you know, the big first weekend. And then President's Day is a big one, and especially now because the D1 coaches come back out of the woodwork and yep. start recruiting. Leading up to MEQs here uh, coming up next month, Bluegrass, uh, here in a couple of weeks. So this is kind of the meat of the season. And then, of course, spring break time, things die down. Even Coach Ball takes a week off, goes down to Florida with the family. And then we gear back up, get the teams ready for nationals. So, yeah, a day in the life of, of, of me right now is getting in here at BSA 8 o'clock in the morning, paying bills, making sure uh, websites are right, making sure team schedules are up to date, uh, all the logistics of running a club, which is fun, 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 of course. Uh then taking a little break for lunch before coming back. Uh, usually kids start rolling in around 4, practices end around 9, 30, 10. Then you do it all again. And then Friday you head off. This weekend I'm actually just down in Empowered at, at Will Robbins' place, oh, yeah. coaching my seventh team. Following weekend I'll be down in Louisville for Bluegrass. And so between running BSA and uh, supporting the 23 other teams and coaching my own, it's it's never a dull moment. Of course, throw in there my son's senior year of basketball home. Uh, he has his senior night tonight. So I'm sure Coach Ball will have some tears in his eyes as he walks his son Dyer out for the last time on the home court for the Hornets. And so a lot going on. I couldn't imagine all those years ago. Here I am at 48, still trying to play just enough to be relevant, uh, trying to hopefully <laughs> make young people to, to live their dreams out like I did while trying to raise a family of four. And so busy times, Rob, but blessed. And so blessed to be here talking with you today about the next endeavor, as if I don't have enough on my plate to try right. to help that I love, you know. That's great to hear. Happy late birthday, by the way. Just turning 48, and congratulations in advance for Dyer's senior day. That's a big deal. Oh, yeah. uh, you mentioned BSA. What a lot of people might not know is that uh, you built your own gym and started your own volleyball club in the town of Angola, Indiana, in far northeast Indiana, uh, a region where you're from, but a lot of people don't know very well and might not, like, pin as a volleyball hotbed what was it like to get a volleyball club off the ground in your home region of northeast indiana yeah kind of a crazy story you know i was approached by a couple of ex ipfw alum jay goldstein Mar uh, and scott lauer about using the name team pineapple which i had trademarked back in 97 for a club in fort wayne obviously a bigger city you know around a million people where ipfw now pfw uh resides and i said sure and, you know, I was still playing overseas, coming back, helping here and there. Uh, as my family and I moved up north to Angola, which is about 45 minutes north of Fort Wayne to the lakes, Lake James, uh, I kind of uh, got out of it, and uh, they continued on different paths. Uh, you know, Will Robbins was there initially with us at Team Pineapple as well, and now he started his own club. And so I came back up to Angola and just had four teams because I had a daughter who played. And so we worked out of the YMCA, nice little small club, Team Pineapple, Four years later, we have 24 teams. Amazing how that happens, I guess. And so we just ran out of space. I own some property up here, and we built BSA, Ball Sports Academy. And here we are now with 30 coaches, uh, 24 teams. Our whole 18U team is already recruited and, and committed. Wow. Uh, I coach teams that are also verbally committed. Uh, I'll be signing next year. And so I guess like the field of dreams, you build it, they will come. You know, we have kids from Toledo that travel over an hour, kids from uh, Grand Rapids that travel over an hour, kids from Goshen Elkhart travel over an hour. And so I'd like to say, and of course I'm biased, uh, it's because of the great coaching staff we have. Uh, many of them you know, you know, Chris Gisson, who also played for us a lot of years, Brian Harris and his wife. I mean, all that have played at a high level and, and obviously have a vested interest in, in growing the sport as I do. And so... 
Yeah, when people say why in Goal, Indiana, I say why not. You know, I don't think you have to be in a metropolis to to make kids better. And and I'm okay that not every girl or boy is you know six four or six eight that walks through the door. I'm okay that not every kid's going to go play D one. All I want to do is help them, um, you know, fuel the fire and passion that they have for sport that I love dearly. And if that means making their sixth grade team awesome, if that means making their high school team awesome, if that means playing D three NAI awesome. And, of course, we have some D1 athletes as well, but I, I don't buy into the thing of where I have to be the best club in the world. I just want to be the best club for each girl or boy who walks through our doors. That's great. I love that mindset. So turning back the clock several years, uh, <laughs> when you were in high school growing up in Northeast Indiana, it was not always guaranteed that you were going to be a volleyball player. Now, you ended right. up going to play for your dad at IPFW, but there is a serious pull towards the sport of basketball. And I went to college in Indiana, so I know as well as anybody how big of a deal the sport of basketball is in the state. What made you pick volleyball over basketball? Yeah, I was recruited by a couple of schools to try to play both. Stanford USC had contacted me about doing basketball and volleyball. At that time, there were a few athletes that could do it, uh, to be completely honest. I was a very average student, and so the possibility of me trying to play two D1 sports and graduate, I didn't think was a great idea. So I decided I'm going to pick one or the other. Um, you know, a lot of schools recruited me for basketball, but you know, in our state, and I and I'd already played AU ball with Pat Knight, Coach Bob Knight's son. So if I was going to play basketball, I was going to play Indiana. And it's, it's only the recruiting trip I took for basketball, to be honest. They brought the plane up to Fort Wayne. I got on it to fly to Bloomington. Uh, they went down there, had my classes already for me. Uh, the first big shock was walking into a Com 100 class full of 400 students. Yep. You know, you went to Purdue, a big school too. I went to a little Woodland High School with only 90 people in my class. Uh, and that was a big shock for me. And that's kind of what got me thinking about, okay, while playing for Coach Knight and I, you would be awesome. A uh, dream for most kids and, and mine, to be honest with you. You know, is this a school where a guy like me kind of gets lost in the shuffle? And, and I know they take great care of their athletes, and there would have been tutors, all those kind of things. But it really started my mind wandering about what I wanted to do. Uh, obviously, you know, if I was going to play volleyball, there's no way I would have played for anybody except my father. Right. Uh, you know, his program was up and coming. They just hadn't taken that last step to get to the Final Four yet. Uh, I was thinking, well, with me in a, in a good recruiting class, which obviously eventually included Norman Amadovar, an All-American, that maybe it could happen. So to be honest, I had a, a press conference at Woodland High School uh, one day, and the night before, I had no idea what I was going to do. I sat there at the kitchen table with my mom and my dad. My sisters were already in bed, and I said, Dad, what what should I do? And I just assumed his answer would be, come play for me, yep. uh, but it wasn't. It was the complete opposite. He's like, I'm not sure how you turned down an opportunity to play for Coach Knight. And Coach Knight had come and watched me play. He had sat down with my father. Uh, I have the utmost respect for the man uh, as a basketball coach, as a, an intelligent man, and, and as a human being. And so I went to bed that night, said my prayers, and woke up the next morning and knew I wanted to play volleyball the rest of my life. I don't know why. Uh, I'm going to trust the good Lord, just put that in my head. Um, but in the end, it was the unbelievable best choice I ever made. Not that I wouldn't have been a good basketball player at IU. I, I think I would have been. I don't know if I was good enough to play in the NBA. But I knew I could have longevity in volleyball. And sure enough, you know, playing professionally until 41, still playing, you know, now when needed, um, I think I made the right choice. And, you know, being able to give back now uh, to kids who have the same dreams that I had uh, makes that choice even more rewarding. The sport is better for that choice that you made, whatever the reasons. That's, that's a heck of a story. So... You did end up going to IPFW. You played for your father, uh, two-time MIVA Player of the Year, your first team All-American, set all kinds of setting records, and then you made the jump to professional volleyball overseas. Uh, first Japan, then Italy, correct? Yep. So what's something about the jump from NCAA to professional overseas volleyball that a lot of people don't know? Yeah, well, it's not for everybody. It's hard. You know, I think there was a bunch of guys and. With the USA team, a couple guys come to mind, you know, Mike Lambert, Tom Sorensen, uh, Brian Ivey, guys who are all Americans, won national titles, played on the Olympic teams who only lasted a year or two. And that's not a slight to them. But it's different when you're not playing, you know, uh, in your own country, right? Own language, uh, your own food, own TV, 
um, family around. And it, at that time, you know, it wasn't like today where you can live stream anything in the world, right? Or you got your cell phone, you're texting your mom and dad all the time. You know, in the, in the 90s when I went over there, true story, my first few years in Japan, the way we communicated with my parents was fax. So I <laughs> fax and sent it to my mom at work, and that's how we'd correspond back and forth. We wow. had a, one of the first ones, but back then it was only AOL, you got mail, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So it was hard back then, right? Uh, so you had to really want to, one, make it your profession, two, love the sport, and then three, hopefully be in a situation where you were getting paid on good teams, all those kind of things. And I was blessed enough that all my experiences in Japan, Italy, Greece, and Russia, you know, I got every penny I was owed. I was on great teams that, that vied for championships every year. Uh, my wife was with me the entire time. Our kids were with us, you know, went to foreign schools, homeschooled. And so it was a family affair. And so the living part, I think, is a big difference that a lot of guys even now go over and go, wait a minute, this isn't as easy to be away from friends and family out of your comfort zone, right? Two, uh, in the playing side, it really exposes your weaknesses. For example, leaving college, setting was probably the worst thing I did. Like I was a big blocker. I was one of the first jump servers, right? A decent defense for a big guy. But, you know, over here, we got so many big guys, you kind of set it up. They go up and kill it. You know, when I went to Japan, uh, I was the tallest guy on the team. Now, we had some other six foot six, six foot seven guys, but if the ball was not in this box, they would could not kill it. You know, it's not like Matt Anderson or Clay Stanley kind of a thing. And so for three years, I had to learn to set the ball one inch higher or, you know, one mile per hour faster or all those kind of things. Otherwise, we didn't get kills. And so in those three years of Japan, I really learned how to set a precise ball so that if Rob Sinclair says, hey, I need it this farther over here, the next ball would be that way, which I didn't have in high school. So each time I kind of learned something, you know, as I went to Italy then, uh, maybe still, but for sure then was the best league in the world. Uh, I learned how to be a professional. You know, the guys came dressed like you see the NBA guys to each game. You know, the guys came with their notebooks, with the plan and the film and all that stuff in it. The guys took strength training in the morning seriously. I mean, it was a professional sport that they would get paid for, not some just show up, you know, throw a uniform on and play like some places are. You know, and the fact I got to play with guys like Andrea Johnny, um, you know, Luca Contagali, uh, uh, my friend Bo Valenta, who passed a few years ago, guys who went back to back to back world championships. Mm -hmm. Never happened. Again. Golden age of Italy volleyball, man. Golden age. And so to play with those kind of guys, I, I just learned how to be a professional volleyball player. So then you go to Greece, and for the first time I get to play with Clay Stanley, Tom Hoff. I'd never played with Americans up to that point in my five years overseas. I mean, six years overseas. And so that was exciting because now all of a sudden my wife's happy because they have wives, <laughs> and they have kids, and they're having coffee dates. But in Greece, I learned how to win. Um, Greece wasn't the strongest league, so there's plenty of times you could have taken a day off, not gone to bed early the night before. But my Eurocles team won 46 matches in a row. Wow. Longest record ever uh, in Greece. And we just learned that every day, regardless of the opponent, we were going to come out and give great effort. And I learned that winning is not something you take for granted, but something you have to do every day. So I left Greece even more confident in the skills that I had. And then the big contract from Russia came. Uh, my parents super nervous about it. Um, I remember calling them about two days after I got to Kazan and go, hey, this place is awesome. Uh, these people here are exactly like Midwest folks. They work their butts off Monday through Friday. They spend time with their friends Saturday night having a couple beers. Sunday they go to church, and they go back and do it all over again with smiles on their face, even though it's minus 20 outside. <laughs> And so that was kind of reassuring for them. And sure enough, I spent six years there. Mm -hmm. And in Russia, to be honest, it was just where it all came together. All the years of training, all the years of playing with national teams and in different club teams, I just became Lloyd Ball. You know, I, I became the winningest overseas player ever. I became the 2008 gold medalist. I became the guy that people saw in Beijing. And it took me a long time to get there. And it took all those experiences, but luckily I learned from them, the good and the bad. And luckily I had family along the way to help me. But I just learned by that time in Russia that I was good. Yeah. That's an incredible arc. Thank you for all those details. That's so cool. Um, with that spectacular like professional resume, plus all the national teams, all the volleyball that you've watched in your life, which is 
which you couldn't possibly try and count the number of hours. At any level, uh, junior girls, professional men's, anything in between, is there something that you can see in a player that just tells you that that player is a good player across all levels, or is it not that simple? It is simple, actually. Uh, but only because, to your point, that I've seen the spectrum of, you know, listen, last weekend I coached our 11 regional team, right, uh, because their coach had to be gone. And so great bunch of young ladies, right, but they're 11 regional team for a reason, right? And so it reminded me of the spectrum of, likewise, we have a 12s team that may be the best in the, in the, in the, in the region, uh, filled with um, ungodly athletes for 12-year-old. And so it's no different like at the highest level, right? There's the greatest of athletes, you know, and then there's the athletes who aren't have as much God-given ability. I tend to look past that. You know, we all want to go and see, you know, the, the amazing girl from Stanford, the plumber girl, right? You can look at her and go, hey, stud, right? Of course. You can look at Clay Stanley or a uh, Matt Anderson and go, hey, stud, of all right? Course. But I try to look past that. And, and these players have this one I'm going to talk about too is I try to look, and it happened last night in our own practice here, my 17s. I try to find those kids that, one, just work on godly hard all the time, blue collar, fresh off the farm, had to give up 5 o'clock to, to milk the cows kind of work attitude, right? And then I look at the kids that see the game. You know, unfortunately, in today's world, we have programmed all these players as robots. And there aren't the ones anymore who just see the game and react to the game without being told by their coach what to do. Yeah. They need a reason why to do that. They don't understand why things are happening. But every once in a while, you'll see this kid, boy or girl, that without telling them will know that, hey, on an off play, where I'm going to tip or down ball or free ball the ball to right back because that's where the setter's coming out of. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I just noticed that this is the middle that served, and so I am going to tip over the left front blocker in front of them, unlike I would do when the libero was there. Or, I'm, I mean, so they recognize, hey, I don't have to tell you that the setter is only 5'8". You should set over top or They just know that. So I look for those kind of kids that don't need me to get, spoon feed them play by play because they see the game. And those are usually the kids that played multi-sport at least up to 14 or 15. Those are usually the kids that aren't on their Xboxes or Playstations that are out playing wiffle ball with ghost runners, right, outside. <laughs> those are those kind of kids that have learned how to play games, that when their families get together and they play Euchre, they're down throwing right bowers and left bowers because they know how to play games. A lot of kids don't have that anymore. My dad and I talk about it all the time. And that's why in our gym we try to facilitate games, games where – they're outside the box, whether it be short court, whether it be whatever it may be, where it's not me dictating where you should be and what you should do, but figure out how to win the game, All right? And so I, I, that's what I look for when I'm picking my team and club. People always ask, well, why don't you take that six-foot girl? She doesn't know how to play the game, right? I want kids who know how to play the game. Now, having a, a couple big hammers doesn't hurt to go along with those kids, but I would say that's the thing that I, I – can pick out based upon your question of seeing so much volleyball. You know, the Riley Salmons of the world. Okay. Knows kid how knew to how win. To play, guy knew how to play the game, right? Perfect. So let's talk about your VLA squad. Let's talk about adult Team Pineapple. But before we talk about Team Pineapple, what the heck is a pineapple? This is a, a pretty hilarious and well-documented story, but yep, there it is. For the people that haven't heard the origin of the pineapple thing, can you tell it to us one more time? Yeah, so in 1991, it was my freshman year at IPFW, we had finally beat Ball State uh, down in Muncie in five-set thriller, 15-13, to go to the Final Four, which just happened to be in Honolulu my freshman year. Hashtag winning, right? <laughs> Not bad. In there. So we get over there, and of course, we're the four seed. Penn State's really good. They're in it. SC is the reigning uh, champs, and then Long Beach was ranked number two. And so we get against SC. This is Jing Kai Lu. This is Dan Greenbaum setting. This is Shepardson. This is Ivy. This is the best team in the country. And of course, by that time, there was no secret. Once again, I said I wasn't a great setter. So anything remotely close to the net, I was throwing straight down with my left hand. And so everybody knew it. So left front would help, middle front would help. I mean, you know, the back row players were all 12 feet and in on any type pass. And so literally the first set, a ball comes up, and it's kind of coming fast, but it's tight. A ball I could have set or dumped, and for whatever reason, I take my right hand, and I just push it back 
over left back's head right in the corner of the court. And it's a point. And I'm kind of celebrating. Everybody's kind of looking around. I've never done it before. What just happened? I don't even know why I did that time. Well, I did it seven more times. (laughs) I had eight of what soon to be called the pineapples back in this corner. So finally, about the number six time, our assistant coach, Denny Johnson, longtime friend of my dad's, played volleyball with my dad at Ball State, goes, looks like Lloyd's lobbing pineapples out there. (laughs) Because the day before we had gone to the Dole Plantation in Hawaii on a trip in Hawaii, yeah. And so I got back and I talked to Dad. I said, Dad, can you have our family lawyer trademark the word pineapple for me? And he's like, Why? I said, Well, I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cool at some point in time to use it. And so sure enough, we trademarked it that year, uh, starting in '97. Every team camp we ever did with Dad was Team Pineapple Camp. Any national thing, our teams were called Team Pineapple. My club, Team Pineapple. You know, it's it's funny, Rob. You know, obviously you see the logo here, the Team Pineapple logo, and mm-hmm. I know you know it. But we take all our kids to nationals, and we got these bright yellow and green gaudy uniforms, <laughs> right, right my back. And they got pineapple all over it. And people come up and go, oh, pineapple, we've heard about you. Those things are awesome. Love your logo. You guys from Hawaii? And I said, look, look, at, look at our team out there. Do they look Hawaiian? a <laughs> list. Hawaiians that you'd ever seen out there if we're from Hawaii. I said, no, we're from Indiana. That's how the story starts. And the rest is kind of history, you know? Great move to trademark that that early, man. That's uh, some some more brand longevity. I love it. So your team pineapple, the one that you're, you're still suiting up and setting the ball for, has had a ton of success the past, I don't know, what, five, six, seven years, like in whatever the highest level of adult volleyball in the U.S. was at the time, you guys were there at the top. And it's a bunch of old IPFW guys. It's uh, kind of a very consistent but not like star-studded cast of characters. Uh, no offense to you or guys like P-Tech or anyone. Very consistent guys. You've talked about it being like a family atmosphere. How have you built that thing with these same guys that has lasted so long and has had so much success? Yeah, I mean, it comes from my dad, you know, um, even though some of us hated him, hated him uh, most of the time we played for him, the, the respect that, that he got from all the uh, the, the, the volley dons, uh, then some of them got married and stuck around here, that we have just always been a family. I, I would argue that we are the tightest volleyball alum family in, in the country. You know, once you're a don, you're always a don. Um, you know, whether it be Spider who texts me every morning, you know, uh, when he gets up at six o'clock, or whether we quit in Spiegel who brings his boys from Buffalo down here to watch us play or play at nationals, um, whether it be Raul who flew in to play for us with 45s last year, Papaleo, uh, we just are always there for each other. And so besides dad, then there's been kind of a core group. Obviously, when I retired and came back, I, I longed for that, for that group of friends that have gone through the same things that I had gone through with dad. And having one of my best friends, Lauren Jebert, right next to me the whole way, whether it be playing or coaching, you know, he's my brother. And so him and I have kind of kept this thing going probably longer than we should have. (laughs) But it's funny how it comes back around. As I look at our roster this year, and each year obviously some of us play less or don't play at all. But now I look, there'll be another Jebert on the roster this year. Yep, I was going to get to that. That's so cool. You know, Lauren's son, Evan, and my goal, you know, selfishly for this VLA is for four years from now, there'll be another ball on it. You know, my son, after he finishes at Ball State. And guys like Tony Price, who graduated recently, or Connor O'Brien, who graduated recently. So we're slowly starting to get some young blood in there, as the LVC and the other teams have done as well. But just enough old seasoning, right, so that we don't lose what it's all about, and that's about family. Uh, the reason we've been successful is because when things go tough or teams are under duress, when you're a family, we never worry about it. We trust that KO will put a ball away or Lesky. We trust that Lauren will come up with one more dig or old man ball will hit one more trickle net ace to get <laughs> us to go. And it's just worked out. And so we'll continue to do it that way until there's no volley dons or chirp chirps left to put on the team. Uh, but I'm super excited about this team this year. You know, like I said, uh, some older guys not playing as much, including myself. You know, I'm looking to give uh, Pasquale and Omar more time setting and just me being around enough to, like I said, hopefully keep our brand going and, and hopefully play well enough when needed. 
Um, same with Jeff Patak, a little less for him. You know, Marcus Nielsen will still be coming in this year to be joining us for two events. The big lefty from Sweden, who's Huge. a very pineapple member. Um, but yeah, we go right down the line with some of the familiar names with Bruno and Tomas and Jazz, guys who've become part of our pineapple family. And once you are, you you know, we don't ever let you go. And so uh, we're excited about this year. Yeah. That's that's perfect. You guys have built a heck of a team over the past several years. But like you said, none of you are getting any younger. So you have found a couple of these young pieces. Uh, Tomas is a huge one that I've noticed the past several years. Matt Crazy. Wall. Yeah, so good. Matt Walsh, uh, the big middle from Ball State. You, you mentioned Price. You mentioned O'Ryan. You mentioned Jebert's son. That's, uh, I'm really excited to see this kind of new Team Pineapple generation and how it uh, – overlaps with the old one and how you guys go the next couple of years it's going to be really fun to watch so before we talk about your role with like the volleyball league of america administratively i want to talk like i have a lot of thoughts on this like just as a big sports fan in general and i'm sure you do too on volleyball's potential just as a spectator sport like how i've thought about this so much i'm sure you have like in a perfect world Americans would see volleyball the same way they see basketball, they see football, they see baseball, they see hockey. It is that cool of a spectator sport. I think it has that potential. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, for some reason, there's always been a disconnect, right? People ask me all the time, the pro league, pro league, and I've been promised a pro league for almost 35 years here, you know, and we've had different attempts as we came up through the ranks. Uh, but why does it work overseas, you know, so well? You know, partly because it's it's been – more affluent to people, you know, uh, whether it be, you know, inner city kids or uh, urban kids or country kids in other countries, you know, they've had access to volleyball. We're just now, obviously, with the huge growth of women over the last decade and a half, uh, the growth in the last couple of years with boys, we're getting there. But how do we get the common Joe or common Sally in the house to turn it on, right? Yeah. Just like you said. I've always told people, once you come to a high-level volleyball game, you'll be hooked. I mean, to see guys and girls of our size and our speed to hit the ball that hard and somehow return it, I mean, people are slowly getting out of the image of the backyard picnic, right, yeah. with, with lammers and the tossers and all that kind of stuff and realizing how hard this sport is and how athletic it is. And so I think we're on the right path, Rob. We just have to get it in front of more people. You know, and people say, well, why isn't it on TV? Well, until until we, we can sell it to the TV people, you have to pay for it to be on TV. That's right. Which has been an issue, right? To raise enough money, even USA Volleyball, to try to raise enough money. And that's why I think they use probably Flow TV because it's expensive to put your programs on national television. That's right. Or even cable television. Luckily, now we're blessed with having online streams and stuff like that where people have access to it. But I think we're close. You know, I think, you know, having seen last year, uh, when we played in Louisville and see 1,500 people around our court watching, you know, it's addictive. Once people get to, get a look at it, they'll, they'll stay. And so we're hoping this year, because we've partnered up with amazing people, that we're going to be in front of hundreds of thousands of young student athletes, boys and girls, that they will see this product. And this product will get more social attention, more social media. And that's what drives the bus nowadays, mm -hmm. right? likes, the views. I mean, you know, Vince, our, our guy is better at that than I am. I'm old school. I can barely text half the time, but I get it, right? So you have to have these people. Then all of a sudden the companies come, right? Because then they want to be part of it because then that's their demographic to sell stuff with. That's right. So when that happens, then the money comes to help fund the league. Then the TV comes. And so it's a progression. Unfortunately, you have to start at the bottom before you get to the top. Okay. The other sports are the exact same way. We're not going to be the NFL tomorrow. But I feel super confident with the people leading this drive by doing it the right way that this will be a monumental year and year two will look even better. And that by the time my son is ready to come and play, this will be a full-fledged funded league that guys out of college have an option to come be part of. To make a living off of. That's the biggest thing. Like, like yep. you said about going overseas, not speaking the language, not having your food, not having your, your TV stations, not having your friends and family around huge deal and it's hard to last it's hard to survive in that and it is like it's just not fair that our american kids don't have an opportunity to stay home and, and do it themselves i think it's well i think if you look at the numbers and i don't remember what usab put out this year as far as how many transfers but we're talking you know just like it's, it's the two percent yeah you know there's tens of thousands of players playing college volleyball and out of those 
I, I know it's not over a thousand that sign contracts overseas. No, even between men's and women's, it's got to be less than a thousand. Contract. How do I get a contract? I'm like, it's hard. You know, unless you have USA volleyball experience or unless you play at a power five school or unless you have some kind of connection already, it doesn't happen. So this is a great stepping stone. You know, and hopefully it's not even a stepping stone. At some point, hopefully this is the destination, mm -hmm. the VOP, right? But even in the beginning, to get those kind of thing about the Ohio State boys who played for LVC last year, yeah. you know, a surgeon and everybody. I mean, they're tremendous players, and, and, and the league helps promote that kind of stuff, you know? So that's what we're looking for. Stepping stone to bigger things until we're the big thing, and then hopefully you stick around, right? That's exactly right. So what is your title and what's your kind of day-to-day -day role in the league in trying to make it the next big thing yeah so I, i'm just basically the the director of networking you know uh i'm only really good at one thing rob and that's uh talking to people and sharing my story hopefully using the team pineapple and lloyd ball brand to help bring uh like-minded people together for this great cause the vla um so when People reach out. I'm kind of the guy who talks to them about sponsorships. I talk to them about what we're doing, how we're trying to do it. Uh, I go in front of boards and, and make pitches about, hey, we don't want this to you know, be some flash in the pan. We need longevity, and we need partners who have, see that longevity and what we're trying to do. And so me, along with Will Foley, are kind of on that committee where we go and talk to prospective partners and sponsors and all that kind of stuff to help raise the money to, to make this league go. Um, you know, likewise, obviously, I'm a director of Team Pineapple. Um, I guess a coach. I don't know, Lauren would probably arm wrestle me for a head coach because it's uh, still a sign of a player. But, yeah, just uh, making sure that I'm running Team Pineapple as a VLA team the best I can, making sure uh, that the VLA uh, was organized. You know, I took uh, the lead as far as making sure it's an incorporated entity, uh, making sure that it has the kind of insurance needs and stuff like that. You know, we've learned from – past experiences that a board of seven people, all that you know, who all are like-minded and, and passionate about the sport, are working together uh, with the same agenda to grow the league the right way. Um, obviously, my relationships with the JVA, with AAU, and Jamie Davis at USAV have been important to, to solidify those partnerships. I mean, we're kind of the first entity ever to make all three of those affiliations kind of work together. We you absolutely know? Uh, are. All three are wonderful. All three try to grow the game. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of competitors in a friendly way, you know, for memberships and stuff like that. But for us to be able to express to them that we are kind of the facilitator of how to make all this happen. Like, we are going to be the ones that all the memberships can look to, that all the affiliations can look to, to grow this sport in a real way. And so the fact we're playing at two AAU events and two USAV events and two JVA events is a testament to those three affiliations to think outside the box and how to truly grow our game, but also a testament to us that they trust in me and the board and, and what we've put in front of them to have the kind of longevity I talked about, but also give a true product of wonderful volleyball, high-level volleyball, and things that they can grow together with us to hopefully grow the game. That's a really good look behind the scenes. I don't think people understand that like this league hasn't even played a regular season match yet, but there's been so much work done by you and the board and everybody else to build this thing the right way, put it in front of the right people, get the right partnerships. And when we show up at that first event in Louisville in early April, it is going to be awesome. People have no idea how great the product is going to be the first time they see it. Can't well, so lucky. And you can appreciate this. So you think about, you know, Daniel's Rising Tide team, uh, Vince's Arizona team, Haas's LVC team, Tim's Iceman team, my team, Pineapple team. I mean, these are the longest running professional teams in our country. Yes, they are. We were PVL teams, right? Mm -hmm. Every other league that came up, we were part of it, right? We were playing in opens, right? And so to have these teams led by people who've been in this for almost a decade shows that we have a great infrastructure. And then we're just smart enough to put smart people like Will Foley on, to put people like Coley on the board, uh, because they know how to get things done. You know, the fact that our schedule is out, the dates when we're playing, where we're playing, all that kind of stuff. I mean, we have worked extremely hard uh, over these last couple months to ensure the success of this first year. And it's just not about the money. 
right, about raising money and having enough money to do it. It's about having the people that, regardless of the money this first year, will put such an amazing product together that I have no doubt the partnerships and the sponsorships that we need to make this go for a long time are coming. And I know they are because I'm working on them, but, <laughs> but it, it's going to be awesome, yeah. That's a perfect outlook. So before we let you go, what is something that everybody what, that watches this video can do to help the league grow? Yeah, biggest thing is, you know, uh, Vince, who does all our social media and stuff, has an amazing YouTube page up for the VLA. Go and subscribe to it. You know, all those uh, subscribers that go then can watch all our content, watch stuff like this, what we're doing right now, just helps drive our bus, helps drive our funding. You know, it doesn't cost them anything to come and just watch the content, watch the games, watch the interviews, uh, go to our website, follow online as far as who's winning and losing this season. All that stuff helps us build up our platform, which in the end is what we're going to go and then be able to fund this league behind. So I ask that they do that. Obviously, when you're at those events, whether you're coaching junior teams or just nearby, come and watch the high-level volleyball. It'll be amazing. You know, we're going to be at Boys in Reno. We're going to be at Adult Nationals with the – I mean, this is how much USAV has entrusted us, which is awesome. The Open Division is called Open VLA Cup. That's right. I mean, that just doesn't happen with, with anybody. And so that's amazing. All our five teams are on. We're hoping to field a 12-field team. We're at AAU Nationals in Orlando. I'll be down there coaching my 17s team, cheering my 14 daughters team on, and playing with Team Pineapple. Uh, you know, we're going to be at all these different venues, JVA, Summerfest, JVA, World Challenge. I mean, if you're anywhere near that, come by, check it out, talk to us. Unlike other professional leagues, there's no ropes. Listen, nope. I remember last year in Louisville. I was, I was peppering with the ball boy. Listen, you'll come out. You can hit some warm-ups with us. Super approachable people, people that we hope hope young people in, aspire to be. That's our goal, right, to inspire people to have the wonderful blessings and lives that a lot of us have had already with this sport. That's what it's all about. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Lloyd Ball, thank you so much for joining us. We will, see you all, we will see you all next time on the next episode of The Deep Corner. Let us know in the comments which uh, VLA personality you want to see interviewed next. And until then, thanks for joining us. We got you.